Good evening. As a trustee of all three organizations which are hosting tonight, I am really thrilled and my heart is just full of passion and love. And tonight I have some of my favorite friends here tonight, so I'm really in love with you all tonight. Thank you so much for being here and thank you Mocha for offering the space. And tonight I'm just introducing this very painful subject, but a very important subject for all of us, not only Chinese, but for non-Chinese, that for 60 years the Chinese Exclusion Act had excluded the Chinese from 1882 to 1943. So it's a subject that we're delighted to discuss in greater detail with our guest speaker and moderator. And so at this point, I'd like to introduce you to Lulu Wang, my fellow C100 member. We are so delighted to welcome together um, this first collaboration between the Committee 100, uh, Facing History, and uh, MOCA, Museum of Chinese in America. And these three organizations um, share uh, overlap in a mission of wanting to um, uh, make the most uh, benefit of the experience that Chinese have in America. And this, um, this the subject of our talk tonight very much is part of the history of Chinese in America. And as Anla said, a, 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 a sad uh, history, but one from which we can all learn. Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Mr. Martin Gold, who is our uh, primary speaker tonight. He, as you know from your uh, bios, he's a senior partner in the law firm of um, um, uh, coming to him, Burling. And he, um, for, with a uh, great deal of effort, pro bono, he was a very major uh, factor in supporting the 1882 project, which uh, successfully sought to have a House and Senate resolution to acknowledge the injustice of the Chinese Exclusion Act laws. And in doing this work, this very important work, Martin and many of those who worked for the repeal worked not only for the Chinese, but for all um, people who come to America and who suffer the early years of persecution before they're finally assimilated into our melting pot in America. But unfortunately, it has been the um, baptismal under fire for many of the new groups who've come to America, but uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act were particularly um, onerous. And as part of this um, legal um, work and research, um, Martin found that um, uh, there were many aspects of the, um, the book that he wrote, The Forbidden, Forbidden Citizens, that um, reflected very much on the Chinese experience beyond the, the subject of the Exclusion Acts. And again, this makes it such a broad and um, encompassing significance to all of us tonight. In May 2013, Martin's book um, garnered the gold medal of the uh, prestigious Benjamin Franklin Award. And we were very um, proud of his uh, being recognized and uh, I'm sure there'll be many other accolades to follow. So it is my pleasure now to um, present uh, Mr. Martin Gold. Thank you. Thank you, Lulu. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so honored to be with you. I want to thank the Committee of 100 and Facing History and the Museum of Chinese in America for the opportunity to present this evening uh, this project, which was, as uh, Lulu said, a pro bono matter for Covington and Burling, was an enormous labor of love for all of us. Uh, I have worked in Washington for over 40 years. Nothing that I have worked on in any subject area gave me as much satisfaction as this project and the passage of those resolutions in the Senate in 2011 and in the House of Representatives in 2012. They passed the resolutions, which was only the fifth time in American history that Congress took an historical retrospective, looked back on the things that it had done, and actually commented on it. That's not to say that from time to time they haven't changed or repealed laws, which of course they have, but the notion of taking an historical retrospective over a sweep of history and commenting upon it that's something that Congress does not do, except in rare instances. And this was one of them. And those resolutions passed in record time in the Senate in four months and in the House in 13 months. And they passed by unanimous consent in both houses without dissension. But the question is, why did Congress act? What is it that Congress had done that the present Congress, which had no responsibility for any of it, felt compelled to comment on. 
That's the subject of tonight's conversation. To understand this story, we have to go back before the beginning, because we know about the 1882 project and the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, but we cannot start in 1882. We must go back to 1870. In 1870, America's naturalization laws were under review. The first Naturalization Act in the United States passed in 1790. Who could become a citizen of this country? And the first Congress of the United States said that only white people could become citizens. Well, in the years since that time, there was a civil war. And the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments were ratified into the Constitution. Times had changed. It's the moment to update the laws. On July the 2nd, 1870, an update is on the floor of the United States Senate, and Charles Sumner, senator from Massachusetts, rises. Senator Sumner was an abolitionist. He was a radical Republican. He was an ally of Abraham Lincoln's. He was at Lincoln's deathbed at, after Lincoln was assassinated in Ford's Theater. That was Charles Sumner. And he rose on the floor on July 2nd, 1870, to present an amendment. And the amendment essentially said this, that the words white must be stricken from the naturalization laws, and that no person in the United States could be denied the right of naturalization on the basis of race. The amendment passed that Saturday afternoon. It passed, but then rose a senator from Nevada named William Stewart, and Stewart was concerned about 100,000 Chinese males on the Pacific coast of the United States, mostly rail workers, who might actually naturalize into the United States and change the political balance on the Pacific coast. And he said, that amendment is not going in this bill. And if that amendment is going to go in this bill, this bill is going to be filibustered. Congress was looking at a July 15th adjournment at that time, there was no remedy in the Senate against the filibuster. Filibusters were not as common in the 19th century, but when they happened, they were fatal. So the only way to stop the filibuster was for the person who was doing the filibustering to desist, and they asked him to desist, but he refused that Saturday evening. Sunday, they didn't work, but they came back on the 4th of July, 1870, to work again, and they went till 11 o'clock at night and Sumner could not get his amendment through because Senator Stewart would not desist. And so finally, in order to take the logjam away, to remove the clog from the legislative pipeline, they took out the Sumner Amendment from the bill. They reconsidered it and removed it, passed an amendment to allow people of African descent to naturalize, and they closed the legislation. After it was over, a senator who had been concerned about the Stewart filibuster said, look, we knew that this matter was controversial to a few people, so we decided we'd do this thing in two segments. First, we would take care of the Africans, and then we'd take care of the Chinese. And in two segments, they did. But the segments were 73 years apart. No person of Chinese descent born anywhere in the world outside of the United States could become a citizen of this country until 1943 when the Chinese exclusion laws were repealed. If Sumner's amendment had passed, those Chinese on the Pacific coast would have been voters. And if they had been voters, they would not have been politically ostracized. And the entire history of the Chinese in America would have been different, I predict, but it didn't pass. Now, when the Chinese exclusion laws were being enacted, it was a period of open immigration in America. No quotas. Immigrants from Europe were welcomed. My grandfather came to this city and lived a few blocks from here in 1908. He was an immigrant from Russia. He was 20 years old. He had no English. He learned English at night. He got a job in the garment industry, which was typical of Eastern European Jews. And he became a citizen of this country as soon as he was legally eligible. After that, he had a 50-year love affair with America. He had those opportunities because he was a European. Had he been Chinese, he would have been precisely the kind of person excluded from this country. 
We can talk about three periods tonight. The pre-1882, the precursor period to the Chinese Inclusion Act, the 1882 law, and laws afterwards, because Congress didn't just look at this once. Congress looked at it again and again and again, nine major enactments. But before there was exclusion, there was welcome. In 1868, the United States and China negotiated the Burlingame Treaty. This was a treaty of equals. If you look at Chinese history and you think about the opium wars and the unequal treaties with the Europeans and so forth, China has a set of grievances about the unequal treaties, but not every treaty was unequal, and this one was not. This was an agreement between the United States, the Grant administration, and the Qing emperor, really the, excuse me, the Andrew Johnson administration and the Qing emperor that fundamentally said there could be the free movement of peoples between China and the United States, and moreover, that Chinese people who did immigrate to the United States of their own volition would be treated like the citizens of most favored nations. So no better, no worse than a person coming from England or France, for instance. Okay? A treaty of equals. There had been 20 years of Chinese immigration basically in America before that time, but this formalized it into law. And then there was a reversal. In the 1870s, there was a big depression in this country. It was the biggest depression before the 1929 depression. That created economic pressure, particularly in California, for low-wage jobs. And in California, agitation rose to try to limit or exclude Chinese immigration. Now, the issue was confined to California for a time because the Chinese population was there. People in Ohio hadn't even seen a Chinese person or Michigan, right? How did this become a national question getting the attention of the Congress? It's easy to understand if you understand the politics of the last fourth of the 19th century. If you look at the five presidential elections between 1876 and 1896, you will find out that in two of those five cases, the winner of the Electoral College and the winner of the popular vote were different. And in one of the other elections where the winner of the Electoral College and the popular vote was the same, the winner of the popular vote won in the entire country by 10,000 votes. And what that tells you is those elections were razor thin. Every electoral vote will count. In the election of 1876, the difference in the Electoral College was one vote to elect Rutherford Hayes president. So both parties begin to think of what they need to do to pander to those six electoral votes in California and a smattering in Nevada and Oregon that could be the difference in a presidential election. And that nationalizes what was otherwise a local issue in California. Okay. By 1879, Congress decides to deal with this. They pass a bill called the 15 Passenger Bill that says that no ship may enter the United States if it has more than 15 Chinese passengers who have to be kept on a separate manifest from all other passengers. In Congress, people said that violates the Burlingame Treaty, the free and open immigration. And in Congress, they knew it. They knew it, and they did not care. They legislated against the treaty. They legislated over the treaty. They didn't care. But when it was presented to President Hayes, he cared, and he vetoed the 15-passenger bill on the basis that it violated treaty commitments to China. Then the United States went about revising those treaty commitments in a negotiation with China that really was not an equal treaty any longer. The United States went to China and they asked for the right to regulate, limit, or suspend Chinese immigration, even though not to restrict it, or prohibit it, excuse me, and China assented. So armed with this fresh authority, they went back to the Congress, the exclusionists did, to seek a new law. Okay? The idea was, now that we've got the right to restrict, let's go ahead and do this. They made an attempt in April of 1882. It's the 20-year bill, okay? The 20-year bill suspended Chinese immigration of all labor. That is both skilled and unskilled for a generation, 20 years. It prohibited state and federal courts from naturalizing Chinese persons. Now you say, well, why in the world do they have to do that? <laughs> 
Okay? Why do they have to do that? Because didn't the Sumner Amendment fail? The Sumner Amendment did, but there was anecdotal evidence that courts in Massachusetts had naturalized a few Chinese people anyway. And so to prevent anybody from doing that again on the theory that California would not want to, by full faith and credit, recognize the Massachusetts naturalization, Senator James Farley of California put an amendment into the bill that said no federal or state court can naturalize a Chinese person. What about the Chinese who are already here? What about them? Well, the treaty anticipated they could come and go. So the legislation provided for return certificates. If you left the country, you could get a certificate from the inspector in California and upon return present it and say, I am legally in this country and I have the right to come in. Okay? Well, this legislation was more than what the United States had bargained for in the negotiation with China. Okay? Restriction does not mean for a whole generation. So President Chester A. Arthur <coughs> vetoes this bill. But now they're right back at it, not waiting years, but waiting weeks, even days. And they come back in May of 1882 with legislation that says, Mr. President, if you don't like 20 years, how about 10? And 10 passes. It passed the House of Representatives in 30 minutes. Okay? And President Arthur signed that. When you hear about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, this is the legislation they are talking about. But Congress wasn't done. They came back in 1884 and extended this extended it to bar the immigration of Chinese people born anywhere in the world and coming to the United States, not just from China. In 1888, believing that the return certificates had been abused and against treaty obligations, Congress passed something called the Scott Act, which essentially rescinded the return certificates and stranded 30,000 Chinese who were outside of the United States overseas at that time. It was a huge bone in the throat for the Chinese government, but the Qing Dynasty was collapsing and there was no heeding the protest. In 1892, the 10 year exclusion law was going to expire. Well, of course, they wouldn't let it expire. They not only renewed it, but they strengthened it. The Geary Act, one of the most pernicious pieces of legislation ever passed, the Geary Act provided for the deportation of any Chinese person who was not walking around with papers demonstrating they were legally in the country. They had to carry papers. Nobody else had to do that. They had to do that. If they didn't have the papers, they were presumptively deportable against all principles of American jurisprudence. They were presumed to be guilty until proven innocent. Well, how to prove them innocent if they don't have the paper? Maybe you can have testimony in court but they were concerned about the reliability of Chinese testimony, so the law literally provides that the testimony can only be taken into evidence if it is corroborated by, quote unquote, one credible white witness. Okay. That was signed into law, extending exclusion for another 10 years. In 1894, China and the United States came up with another treaty that basically said in exchange for restoring the return rights that the Scott Act abrogated will allow you to restrict totally Chinese immigration for workers for, excuse me, for 10 years. So that overrode the Scott Act and that became the rule. It exempted a few people, officials, tourists, students, teachers, merchants, but the definition applied to them by immigration inspectors was very, very narrow. A teacher is not a high school teacher. A teacher is a college professor, you know, that type of thing. A merchant is not a peddler. A merchant is someone with a storefront. So basically, even these exempted classes were mostly restricted. In 1902, Congress renewed the law indefinitely, consistent with treaty obligations. In 1904, China withdrew from that Gresham Yang Treaty. So Congress said, well, if you're going to withdraw from this, we're just going to impose the policy unilaterally. And in 1904, Congress made the Chinese exclusion law permanent, and there it stayed for 40 more years. 
The debates in Congress were extremely harsh. In the book Forbidden Citizens, I quoted members of Congress at length. I did that not to fill space. I did that because I wanted people to understand what those debates were like so that nobody would believe that somehow we had mischaracterized the debates, that we said in some fashion they were prejudicial or racist, when what do they mean by that? So I let members of Congress speak for themselves. John O'Neill of Missouri made a point here. He said, this was in 1888 at the time of the Scott Act debate, no campaign, that was an election year for president, no campaign is complete without Chinese legislation. This is one of the most important public figures of the 19th century. Not many people know him now, but he was a prominent American. This is James Blaine of Maine. They called him the Magnetic Man. He had been a representative in Congress, Speaker of the House, later on a United States Senator, a would-be candidate for president several times until he finally was the Republican nominee in 1884, and Secretary of State under three presidents. In the 15 passenger debate, he posited something which was unique at the time, but later on became a fundamental point in the exclusion debates. His idea was this. We should not admit the Chinese to citizenship. We should not because they cannot assimilate with the American population. They look different, they dress differently, they eat different kind of food, they have a different kind of language, you can't understand it, and so on, right? In other words, they are a distinct population we judge they cannot assimilate, therefore they shall not be permitted to assimilate. They shall not be entitled to naturalize and become American citizens. And if they cannot do that, they should not be admitted to the country in the first place because it is a bad policy to have an underclass of people admitted to the country as workers who cannot aspire to American citizenship under any terms. So this statement, we have to decide whether we'll have for the Pacific Coast the civilization of Christ or the civilization of Confucius is on the basis that we will have an unassimilable population massing on the Pacific Coast and ultimately it will take over the Pacific Coast because it will overwhelm the local population. Other people won't go to California because they can't get jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, let's keep them all out. This man is Albert Shelby Willis of Kentucky. This quotation comes from the 1882 20-year debate Okay, although he was the sponsor of the 1879-15 passenger bill. This is a very nasty commentary, but quite typical of what was said on the floor of Congress in those debates. Okay. So you can get a sense of the nature of the debate. Okay. Now, there were not just people supporting exclusion. There were also people who opposed it, even though they became in a dwindling minority over time. Here's one of them, William Rice of Massachusetts. If you looked at the Congress as a whole and said who was for exclusion and who was against it, Democrats generally were for exclusion, particularly ones from the South. Republicans on the Pacific Coast were for exclusion as well. All members from the Pacific Coast were. In the Middle West, a bit less so, if there was an anti-exclusion element anywhere, it was the Northeastern Republicans who were the legacy of the Abraham Lincoln Republican Party. William Rice was one of those. Blaine was one of those too, which made so significant his departure within mind the 1880 election, okay? This is a congressman from Illinois, Robert Hitt. As a young man, he was a law clerk in Illinois, a clerk to a local lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln. He got elected to Congress. He's talking here about the Geary Act, the idea that you have to walk around with papers proving your innocence or otherwise they throw you in jail. And I point this out only to say, no one can possibly imagine that Congress did what it did, ignorant of the effects of what it was doing. There are no unintended consequences here because they were told, they were told about this kind of policy and passed the legislation anyway. Okay. And then there were real heroes. This is a hero. 
George Frisbee Hoare, Senator from Massachusetts between 1879 and 1904. He was a senator during the entire period of exclusion. He opposed every last exclusion measure. In 1902, which was the last major debate on these topics, Senator Hoare was by that time an elderly senator. He said nothing for a week of debate. Just before the final vote, he rose. And he makes this statement. He says, I'm not going to be for this bill. You can't do anything to it that will improve it, because it is fundamentally against American principles. And he made this statement, and he says, as this bill violates these principles, I am bound to record my protest if I stand alone. Here is the vote. And it is for this reason that the book Forbidden Citizens is dedicated to that senator. Henry Nathan was a congressman from Massachusetts for four years at the very beginning of the 20th century. He offers us the best explanation of the Chinese exclusion laws. Okay, And here it is. He said this approving of the 1902 extension. Okay, But this gives it to you in a capsule. Now, the element, when you think of Chinese exclusion, you think of exclusion from immigration. That's natural, and that's true. But it also involves exclusion from naturalization. And if you want to understand the significance of that, let's go back to our friend William Stewart, the man who filibustered the Sumner Amendment. He was in the Senate a long time, and in 1904, when the law finally passed making it permanent, he claimed his trophy. And he said he'd go back to 1870 and talk about what he did then. If they had been allowed to have become naturalized and become voters, there wouldn't have been any exclusion. If anybody has difficulty connecting the dots between the denial of political rights and the presence of political ostracism, Senator Stewart can connect them for you. By 1943, the United States and China are in a wartime alliance against Japan. And attitudes toward the Chinese population have changed. And attitudes toward Chinese immigration has changed. The Gallup organization took a survey as to whether the exclusion law should be repealed. No place in the country was there greater support for it than on the Pacific Coast, the place where the Chinese exclusion law started in the first place. Madam Chiang Kai-shek came to Washington on February 18th 1943 to address both houses of Congress. Now she addressed the Senate first and then she addressed the House. Here we see her standing with Speaker Sam Rayburn. But by courtesy of YouTube, we're going to listen to her because I want to show you the reception that she got in the Congress and the attitude that had changed toward China. You, as representatives of the American people, had before you the glorious opportunity of carrying on the pioneer work of your ancestors beyond the frontiers of physical and geographical limitations. You have today before you the immeasurably greater opportunity to implement these same ideals and to help bring about the liberation of man's spirit in every part of the world. In that year, repeal legislation was advanced. Warren Magnuson was a later a United States senator, but then a congressman from Seattle, because he was from the Pacific Coast, was selected to sponsor the Magnuson Act for repeal. Okay? And it was a wholly bipartisan effort. His partner in it was Congressman Walter Judd of Minnesota. Walter Judd was a freshman member. He spoke more on this than any other member in that debate. Why? Because Congressman Judd freshman member from the minority party was Dr. Judd, who had spent 10 years in China as a medical missionary and was a close ally of Pearl Buck and others who were seeking the repeal of the exclusion laws, and he was recorded great deference in the debate. Both houses of Congress passed this. When President Franklin Roosevelt returned from Tehran in his conference with Churchill and Stalin in 1943, this legislation was on his desk, and he signed it on December 17th, We've now passed the 70th anniversary of the repeal of the Chinese exclusion laws. On May 26, 2011, these resolutions were introduced in the House by Judy Chu and Judy Biggert, the Judy resolution, right? 
and the Judy Resolution wound up gathering a large number of co-sponsors in the Senate, Scott Brown of Massachusetts and Diane Feinstein of California. Note something. The principal sponsor of both the House and the Senate resolution were freshman members of the minority party. And still, the resolutions passed. Finally, I want to show you the moment of truth in the House of Representatives, June 18, 2012. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five this legislative days Smith, within which to revise and extend their Speaker. remarks and include extraneous materials on House Resolution 683 currently under, under consideration. Without objection. Gentlemen and from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlemen to recognize. Mr. Speaker, I first want to thank the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu, for introducing H.R.E.S. 683, expressing the regret of the House of Representatives for the passage of laws that adversely affected the Chinese in the United States, including the Chinese Exclusion Act. I know through conversations with several of my colleagues, including the ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee, Mr. Berman, that this is an important resolution for them and their constituents. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentlelady is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of House Resolution 683. First, I want to thank Chairman Lamar Smith and Subcommittee Chair Trent Franks of the Judiciary Committee for all their work on this resolution. I appreciate it so much. We have come together across party lines to show that no matter what side of the aisle we sit on, Congress can make amends for the past, no matter how long ago those violations occurred. It is because we have worked together in a bipartisan way that we will make history today. Today, for the first time in 130 years, the House of Representatives will vote on a bill that expresses regret for the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, one of the most discriminatory acts in American history. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and agree to House Resolution 683? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the resolution is agreed to, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. And in fact, there was no dissent, and this is the last slide. This is a great man, Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. Hannibal Hammond was Abraham Lincoln's first vice president. He served the Lincoln administration in the first term. When Lincoln ran for re-election in 1864, they moved Hamlin off the ticket to replace him with a Southerner who had opposed secession, believing that that would assist in the reconstruction of the Union. Hamlin had been a senator from Maine. After sitting out a few years, he was returned to the Senate by Maine, and he came back in 1868, serving for 12 more years and becoming chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. His committee was the committee that reported the 1879-15 passenger bill. It was not the practice at the time for a committee chairman to bottle legislation in committee that a majority of committees supported, so it came to the floor without recommendation, but Hamlin's recommendation was in the negative. He made a speech denouncing that legislation as a violation of fundamental American principles. And at the end of the speech, this distinguished American said, I leave this vote against this measure. I leave it as a vote, the last legacy to my children, right? That they may esteem it the brightest act of my life. His statue stands in Statuary Hall outside the chamber of the U.S. House of Representatives. After the Judy Chu resolution passed, I walked Congresswoman Chu out to that statue to show her this, to tell her this story, and to say, never look at the statue the same way again, because this is a great man. In 1879, he lost. In 2012, we redeemed his legacy. Okay. And that day, when I walked out of the Capitol, I passed by the statue again. I put my hand on his shoe and said just three words, thank you, Senator, and thanks to you.